Praise God. Hallelujah. That last thing is, is my fault. So, God bless you. Praise God. How would you like to be, how would you like to be the, the guy that follows the greatest spiritual leader in history? I mean, to be, to, to go into his office and, and find out that you're his replacement. And you don't necessarily know anything about how he did what he did. Well, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. God bless you. Be seated. Get comfortable, but not too comfortable. And uh, what a great congregation. What a great church. What a great calling. Great pastor, pastor's wife. And I didn't know that you played like that, see? And sang like that. Praise God. So, I'm going to be in, uh, eventually we're going to get to the book of 2 Kings, and I want to talk about, I've got, a, I've got a set of notes here that are just fresh off the press, um, and it's titled, The Price of the Promise. I want you to, I want you to understand something. There are certain obligations uh, to a church that has a promised destiny. There are certain obligations that fall upon a church that has a promised destiny. And you've got to realize that to, to get to that destiny, to get to that place that God wants you to go, there are certain obligations. It's not just some kind of blanket, you know, okay, everything's going to be super smooth and everybody's going to be on fire and I'll take care of it. I've got it. I'm God signed. Have a good day. You know, it's not like that at all. There are certain obligations that are imposed upon a church that has a promised destiny. There's a price to the promise. There, and let me, let me say this before we go into the, to the book, and that is that there is, there's a true biblical anointing, and then there's a bunch of stuff that's just crazy. People are self-anointed, people anoint each other uh, with, by words and by action and by just lathering them up with praise and, and that kind of thing, and, and then there's a true anointing. And that true anointing is always, biblically speaking, it's always for real service. True anointing is for real service in the real kingdom of God. And that true anointing is for people that are dedicated to the service that it's intended toward. Does that make any sense? So true anointing, biblically speaking, is only for real service. It's actually for ministry. The, the, the pure sense of the word ministry, to, to serve. And it's only going to fall on those people that are dedicated to that kind of service. Everything else is false anointing. All these TV preacher idiots, that's not true anointing. They're just money making. That's all they're doing is, is earning a living and going way beyond earning a living. It's not, about, it's, not about, it's not about serving people. It's about being served for them. But in the real kingdom of God, in the real church, true anointing is for genuine service ministry. One of the greatest Bible stories about, about this kind of thing is in 2 Kings 2. And, you know, let me read verse number one, and you'll know exactly. I mean, if you're a student of the Bible, you'll know exactly where, I, where we are in this story. Chapter two, verse number one of Second Kings. It came to pass that when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And you, like I said, you students of the word, you, you know how this is going to end. You know that Elijah is going to be caught up in a whirlwind. 
after a fiery chariot pulled by fiery horses comes out of heaven and rides right between the two of them. Uh, as Elisha, probably with his mouth just gaping open it, it, and eyes wide open in awe of what he's seeing and experiencing, and as this fiery chariot goes by, a wind comes, a whirling, it's like a, in Africa we had a lot of dust devils, and you could be driving someplace or be out in the village or, or something, and the sun would cause, and a little bit of wind, it, it would stir up these little dust devils, and then they would get bigger and bigger. I've seen them when they're hundreds of feet high. Sometimes they're strong enough to knock you down. They're strong enough to tear roof sheets, metal roof sheets off of church buildings. It's, it's amazing. So here this whirlwind comes out of nowhere after the chariot goes by. And the next thing you know, Elijah is gone. And Elisha is in his place. That's the context of chapter 2 of 2 Kings. But I really want to start by reading a, just a few verses in 1 Kings chapter 19, because this is where it actually begins. I'm talking about the price of a promise. I'm talking about the price of being one of those dedicated people, one of those dedicated congregations that's dedicated to the will of God and dedicated to finding true ministry and expecting absolutely pure anointing from God to carry it out. In other words, I'm preaching, this is going to sound funny, but I'm preaching to the congregation tonight, but I'm also preaching to certain individuals in the congregation. It may not make sense, but that's the way actually the dynamics of what's going on right now. God's going to speak to the congregation. So you're going to get, you're going to get something that says that speaks to the congregation. Antioch North, this is the way it is. And then there's going to be certain individuals in Antioch North that realize that hey, I'm part of this thing like never before. I'm in this thing. I want this thing more than anything else. See, there's a will of God here. There's a will of God for this church. If you don't believe that, you can't quite understand the, the depth of what God wants to do on a regular basis here. But if you understand that you, you're a congregation that has a, a destiny to be, to be greatly used by the hand of the Lord, then you start to understand that as a member of this congregation, you can be a direct part of that. Man, I would hate to sit in the back row of a church that had that kind of a promised destiny. I wouldn't do it. I would force myself to get up and, and respond at the right time in the right way. Here we go. 1 Kings 19 and starting with, uh, let's just start with, number five, with verse 15. The Lord is speaking to Elijah after this, this great series of, of acts that, that Elijah has carried out by the power of God. And he's met the enemy. He's, I mean, he's, he's, he, he's pronounced a, a drought over the land. And then he's pronounced the rain coming back. He's, he's made Ahab, King Ahab, look like a fool in front of his people. And then he's tried to make amends by, 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 by running so fast that he, uh, this old prophet is running so fast, he runs ahead of, uh, of Ahab's chariot. And I mean, it's just, it's just a wonderful story. And then, and then he faces the threat of Jezebel, Ahab's wife, that says, just as, as surely as you wiped out the prophets of Baal, I'm going to wipe you off from the face of the earth. I'm going to kill you. The very, next, the very next chance I have. And, and then Elijah gets up and he, he goes away and, and is fed by an angel for days while he's, while he's sheltering himself from the threats of... I mean, what a story of this prophet's life. This is the guy that called down fire from heaven. It's an amazing man. He looked like a wild guy. I mean, he dressed funny and he, he just... I mean. He, he, he sounds like a rough character to me, but he loved God more than anything and would do anything for and with God. But now the time is coming to where his successor is going to be anointed. The man that's going to take his office from him as Elijah goes on to be with the Lord. But before that, in verse 15 of 1 Kings 19, the Lord speaks to Elijah and says, Go and return on the way to the wilderness of Damascus in Syria. And when you come... Appoint Ahazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall you appoint to be king over Israel. 
and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in your room, in your place. So he gives him three anointings to take care of before he, his death, or before his translation, as it turns out. Because he's just, he, doesn't, he doesn't die in that whirlwind. God just circles him with the whirlwind after the chariot goes by, and whoosh, here he goes. Kind of like Enoch back in the book of Genesis. Kind of like Moses, you know, disappeared somewhere and is buried somewhere. And we don't even know why or how or, or where because God buried him. I mean, who does God bury? Wow. So these are three great characters and this is the third one. So, so God gives him... The, 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 the word to go and take care of these three anointings, two kings, and then anoint Elisha that will take your place. Now watch this. Verse number 18. Uh, excuse me, verse number 19. So he departed. After God told him this, he departed and he, he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat. And he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. And he was with the 12th. And Elijah passed by him and all he did Man, you've got to get this part because this is where it starts. This is the start or the finish. You can choose, Elisha. All he did was take off this outer garment. And as he passes by Elisha, who's working, plowing in the field, he simply drapes the mantle across his shoulders. And, he, and Elisha leaves the oxen. And runs after him. He runs after him. Wait a minute. He put a, the mantle on him. Why is he running after him? Because he puts the mantle on him. And while Elisha is standing there trying to comprehend what's going on, Elijah's just walking off. Because he's, 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 he's in the midst of doing what God told him to do concerning Elisha. Go and anoint him. Well, in this case, it means with his mantle. So he, he sees Elisha. He finds him in the field. He takes off his coat. He puts it around Elisha's shoulders. And Elijah keeps on trucking. So in, 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 the, in the seconds or the, you know, part, however long it took for Elisha to realize exactly some of what was going on, he runs after him. And he says, let me, I pray you, kiss my father and my mother. He doesn't say, he doesn't say like Jesus warns us about in the, in the Gospels. He doesn't say, let me go and bury my mom and my dad. He just says, let me, let me go kiss them. Why? Because he's leaving. He's, he's in the field with the oxen. The man of God walks by, puts his mantle around his shoulders. And in a few seconds, Elisha comes to the decision, I'm going to do this thing. I feel something like I've never felt before. I've seen something that I've never seen before. He may never have gone outside the farm as far as I don't know. But he knows this is his moment. He knew before this happened, somewhere in some prayer, at some time alone, Elisha knew that there was coming a day. There was coming a day when he was going to make a decision, not a bad decision, but a good decision. Somewhere maybe between the ages of 19 and 25, I don't know. But it's going to happen. There's going to be a day like this in my life. And I'm, I, I, I'm telling myself I'm not going to miss it. So here's the, here's the anointing of the mantle. And then Elijah starts to walk off. And Elisha runs after him and says, Please, let me just go home. Let me go home and kiss my father and my mother. And then I'll follow you. I'm going to tell him, I'm going to tell him goodbye. Yeah. And Elijah, look at what Elijah's response is. And he said unto him, well, Go back. Go back again. Go back again to your house. And then this question. Because what have I done to you? My, my, my. That's where it all starts, Antioch North. What has he done to you? you? You probably heard me testify about this before, but I mean, I loved, I loved the thought of missions for, for a long, well, I say a long time, but it was really a, a it was a short experience in the, you know, in the scale of life. I mean, I was, I was saved at Antioch in 78, and by 84, we were full-time in Africa. But somewhere in between there, I learned to love missions, and I learned to, 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 to 
to chase after the, I guess it was a dream at first about becoming a missionary. And I, I would go to mission conferences. I would go to mission services. I would, I would just, I would fall down and, and pray and beg God to make me a missionary. And, but the reality hit me later when, when we got an appointment to do it, to, to go and be one. And then I realized, you know, as much as I've longed after this thing, um, what do I know about being one? And what I didn't know was that what I didn't know didn't really make much difference. I just had to answer the call. I knew that there was going to be a call. I, know that, I knew that somebody was going to come by and put the mantle around me and then ask me the question, what have I done for you? What, what is this all, what does this mean to you? And so he goes back and he parts ways with his mother and his father in the farm. Well, a little bit of time goes by and now we're in 2 Kings chapter 2. It was the time when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind. And Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now watch what happens. And Elijah says unto Elisha, wait here, stay here. I pray thee. Look at the, look at the scene. Look at the characters. Look at who's, who's involved in, in this story in chapter 2. We've got, we've got Elijah, the man of God that is so sure. When he, does, when he does what God tells him, he's absolutely confident, 100% sure of, that God spoke to him and he carries it out to the T. No doubts in Elijah's mind about who he is and what God's called him to do. And we've got Elisha, who at the drop of a mantle, gives up everything he was in order to become what God wants him to, to be. And then just, you know, in just another verse, and a couple of verses in verse number three, we've got these, these guys that are called the sons of the prophets. So who are all these characters in this message that I'm preaching? Well, we've got Elijah, and to me, he represents the power and the will of God. He represents this, this, this seemingly irresistible force that's, that comes into the earth to do what he wants to do. And Elijah has answered it perfectly. He, he just represents the will of God, and certainly for Elisha. He's the will of God personified as he finds him on the farm and casts his coat around him and says, you know, do you realize what, what's going on here? And we've got Elisha. That's you. That's the congregation. And it's also the people in the congregation that make the congregation the real congregation. Now, if, if you've got deadbeats here, Brother Simpson, and I know you probably don't, but if you've got some spiritual deadbeats here, that's not Antioch North. It's not. They're, dis, they're discounting who they are, and somehow they're trying to discount who you are. But it doesn't work like they just all really all they're doing is disqualifying themselves. And by what you do that's right in the will of God, you are you're finding them out. You're calling them out. You're shouting them down. By your actions totally committed to the will of God, you're telling that kind of thing that doesn't belong here. That's not who we are and that's not what we do. You remember that part, don't you? That's Elisha. Because he's going to do this thing. He's going to see it through. And then we've got these sons of the prophets. These are the halfway people. They claim to be following after God. They're, they're at, they called it the, a school of prophets. They had schools in various places. And they had these young men that were coming, being groomed to become priests and prophets. I don't know. That's what it says. So they're there, and yet they don't do, they don't do much of anything right in this story. They're just there. They're like, they're like church people that just can't seem to get it. Or they're like onlookers that look at us and they just don't seem to get it. And they don't get why we're doing what we do. They don't get how we do what we do. They don't get why we do what we do. They don't understand our talk. When we, when we speak the language of a revival congregation, they don't get it. So here's the characters in chapter 2. 
And Elijah, tell, Elijah tells Elisha, the power and the presence and the will of God. Look at Elisha. And, 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 and maybe you think the will of God wouldn't tell me to stay when it's time to go. But I'll tell you one thing. God takes us all to places of decision. Every, every day of your life, you're faced with decisions that end up defining who you are and what you'll become. Don't tell me that God doesn't lead us to crossroads because I've come to a zillion of them. And I've made the right turn, hopefully most of the time, and I've flubbed the dub other times. But Elisha's bent on doing it right. But Elijah tells him, hey, stay here. I, I, I'm begging you, just stay here. Now, this is, this is the word of the man of God to the, to the future guy. Elisha doesn't know exactly that he's, that he's the future, but he knows there's a great destiny ahead. And he knows, he's, he, knows, he knows that something's going to happen to Elijah. He knows there's a change coming. The Bible says that. He knows something about, he may not know the details, but he knows something is afoot. Something is moving here. Something's happening. Why is he telling me to stay here while he goes to Bethel? Bethel means the house of God. And it was a city. But don't, don't discount its name. Elijah is going to the house of God. He's going to a city that's called the house of God. And he tells Elijah, you stay back here on the way to Gilgal. I'll go alone. And Elijah's response is perfect. As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. I'm not going to let you leave me behind. You, to me, Elijah, you represent the will of God. You represent the presence of God. You represent the destiny of God. You represent everything I've hoped for up till now in my life. And you're telling me to stay here while you go to the house of God? No way, I'm going. So they go. But the sons of the prophets, saw, they heard all this. And they were at the ones at Bethel. They came to Elisha and said, hey, hey, don't you know that the Lord is going to take? They knew too. They knew that something was coming up on Elijah. Don't you know that the Lord's going to take away your master? Aren't you a little bit afraid? Do you think you really ought to go with him? Don't you think it's better that you just stay where you are? You can't stay where you are. You can't stay where you are and be the true Antioch North if it's going to be a church of a promised destiny. Can't stay where you are. And Elisha says, yes, I know all about it. But hold your peace. In other words, don't try to stop what I'm doing. Praise God. So they go. Verse 4, Elijah says to them, Elisha, wait here. Wait here at Bethel. Wait here in the house of God. That sounds pretty good. That sounds like a spiritual place to be. That sounds like a compromise that he could take and still be okay. And it's true. He could have taken this compromise and stayed in the house of God and probably become one of the sons of prophets, but he never would have become the successor of Elijah. I don't think, I, I'm not so sure at all that Elijah knew how God was testing Elisha through him. I don't think he knew. But he felt compelled for some reason to tell him to stay at Bethel while I go on to Jericho. Elisha's answer is the same. As, as much as God is alive and as much as you stand here alive, I'll never leave you. And the sons of the prophets at Jericho, there was another school there. It was a campus ministry. With no great head to it. Don't you know that the Lord is going to take away your master from your head today? And he says, of course I know it. Hold your peace. I don't want to hear about that. Verse 6, Elijah said unto him, okay, then stay here at Jericho. Look at these places. Bethel, the house of God. Jericho. What's Jericho to you? What's Jericho to Israel? What does Jericho represent in the Bible? Victory. It's the place they, when they came across the Jordan, the first place they attacked, and they, all they had to do was walk around for a few days. Victory. And they saw the walls come a-tumbling down. So it's a nice place to stay. It's a good place to compromise. A little bit of victory, feeling pretty good. In the house of God, have some victory. It's okay to, to level off right there, not for Elisha. 
not to become the successor to the man of God. Stay here. Because I, the Lord is sending me to Jordan. 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 The beginning of entering the promise. But also the place that's impossible to cross. It took a miracle for Israel to come through that river. So I'm going to, why are you going to Jordan? Elisha might have asked in his own mind. Why, why would he go to, to the place where you can't go any further from there? So you stay here at Jericho and the Lord sending me to Jordan. Oh no, as, the, as your soul lives, I won't leave you. And they went on. And watch this in verse 7. Now the men of the, the 50 sons of the prophets, they don't even stay close now. They watch, they watch what's going to happen from a far distance because, they're, frankly, they're afraid. And they get there, the place of the impossible. Now let me tell you something. I, I had two or three people. I mean, you were very nice to me this morning. And after that long story about my wife, you know, and, and that ectopic pregnancy and the, the deliverance, you know, that, that followed it. Two or three of you came up to me and said, I, I, that testimony was overwhelming. And I think to every one of you, I said something to the effect of, it's true, but I feel like we had to go through that. Had to go through that. We had to see, we had to see how God could simply intervene. We had to hear the word of the Lord that was spoken to me on a crackly phone line that said, Brother Ted, everything will be all right. And then we knew, we knew. When the doctor said, it'll kill her, she's already dead. She's as good as dead. We had to go. We had to do this. We had to cross over Jordan, even though it was physically impossible. You can't bleed that long from that and live. You can't expect to get whole, fresh, healthy blood in a bush hospital at the, in the middle of the AIDS epidemic. But it was there. <laughs> you can't survive a rebel attack from the Renamo rebels. Guns firing in the bushes, you know, during the night. And the Zambian army trying to chase them down and push them back across the border into Moza. You can't survive these things. These guys are ruthless. But you got to cross over the Jordan. Or you can stay on this side. Any act north, you can stay where you are if you want. Elisha wouldn't have any part of that. Elisha would declare to you that if you're going to stay here, I'm moving on. Antioch North, if you want to stay here, okay, but I'm pulling out of Antioch North. You won't have it. I've preached, I've preached before at, at the 45th, I think, whatever, the anniversary at, at, at Antioch. I, you know, I, I preached a message about, about Caleb. About Caleb in his old age. You know, telling, telling, uh, who's he telling? Caleb and, Mom, thank you. <laughs> You know, Joshua's dividing up the land and he gets, he gets to his old pal, Caleb. You know, wh where are you going to go? He says, give me that mountain that, give me that mountain that scared everybody away. Because I knew from the very beginning that I could take that thing with God's help. An 80-year-old man. I'm just as strong now as I was then. Give me that mountain. It's impossible, Caleb. No, no. Not with God. You're going to come to places that looks impossible. You're going to face stuff that's impossible. As individuals and as a congregation. And you're going to go to prayer. And you're going to redeclare who you are. And you're going to redeclare who God is. And you're going to remind yourselves of what he did for you in the past. And how he snatched you out of the jaws of defeat more than one time. And you're going to restate who you are. And you're going to rededicate yourself to his will like never before. And that's how you get the promise. That's how you get the destined promise of a revival church. You can't play around in this game.
You can't go to the Congo, Sister Simpson, and play silly games. The Congo will eat you alive. But just before we got our resident visas for the Congo, which took 17 years to get, 17 years we waited for a, for a registration of the church. We tried everything under the sun. Wouldn't play their stupid corruption games. Wouldn't pay off the government officials. So we just waited and we waited and we waited. And it took an assassination of a president. And it took the, the son of the president coming in to become president. And it took somebody that knew the secretary of, of the, the ministry of justice. And, and, and it got us into uh, Anyway, so we get this thing. And now it's time. Now we can get resident visas. 17 years of waiting. 17 years of working back and forth across the border in the bushes between Zambia and Congo. Sometimes getting permission to go in, training, moving, driving through the bushes, flying on broken down aircraft, that you, bald tires. I mean, unbelievable stuff, impossible stuff. And by the time when we finally got our resident permits... Man, how old was I? I don't know. I, I mean, I had been in Malawi. I had been in Zambia for 13 years. We've gone, been to Botswana and, and resurrected the church that was dying in Botswana for a couple of years. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, in the sta- I'm at the stage then where, uh, you know, it's time to start like slowing down. And it's like got crest the hill and put it on coast for a while. Those thoughts went through my mind and I, you know, and, and, the, and there were other missionaries from other organizations, other pilots in Botswana. And when I told them, hey, we got our stuff for the Congo, so we'll be pulling up stakes here. These guys looked at me like I was an, I was an idiot. Why would you leave Botswana where there's smooth roads and air conditioning in apartment buildings and, and health care and hospitals and doctors and good schools and smart people and people with PhDs coming out of everywhere? Unbelievably advanced country. Why would you leave that? Why would you go to Congo? This is the best post a missionary could get over here in Africa. They used to call it Africa for beginners. That's how easy it was. <laughs> That's what missionaries call it. It's Africa for beginners. You want an easy ride? Go to Botswana. You can live almost like an American there. You can live up better than an American there. Why do you want to go to Congo? I'll tell you why. Because of some silly little promise that I kept back in here for 17 years. Because who else is going to go? And do you know who's gone after us? Nobody's gone after us. There's no resident missionary in the Congo. We don't have a resident missionary there. You know why? It's just too bad. It's just too tough. Not for Caleb. Give me that mountain. Not for Elisha. As God lives and as your soul lives, I'll never leave you. I'll never leave the will of God. I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you from experience that this is the real deal. And I know we can banty about terms about being a revival church, but I promise you, the minute you started throwing out words like that, God's going to say, okay, okay, now let's see. You stay here. It's okay to stay here. Elijah's not going to rebuke him. Elijah's just going to go on. He's going to take his mantle back and he's just going to go on. And as Elisha calls after him from back where he's staying put, Elijah, and Elijah's simply going to turn around and say, what? Do you know what I've done for you? I guess not. So there they are standing together, just two guys. One's about to be finished. One's just about to start. Standing at the banks of the Jordan. No way to get across. What's this all about? Why is Elijah looking across over there? Why are the sons of the prophets staying back a good distance in case a fireball comes out of heaven? And all of a sudden, Elijah took that same mantle that he had anointed Elijah with. And he wraps it together and he smacks it on the water. And in a split second, the waters divide. Remember the first thing I asked you tonight? How would, you be, how would you like to be the one that succeeds a man like Elijah? No training. 
And the only qualification is what? Being the real deal. No funny stuff. No fighting for position. No, no, none of this stuff. Not, no, none of this stuff about I'm better than you or I'm seeking a position or I'm seeking a title or I'm seeking a post or give me this or give me that or make me the, the, you know, the, the, the minister of so. None of that junk. All right. Just I'm going to follow after this like I'm following my own, my own beating heart. So they went over on dry ground. Can you imagine the sons of the prophets in the distance? If they had binoculars in there, can you imagine them looking down and seeing these guys, seeing the waters back up and wishing inside that they had been right there when it happened? You can expect that too. You can expect jealousies and envies and they're talking bad about you, trying to figure out what kind of magic you did to, to stop the waters from... Flowing in the Jordan so you could get across. When they were gone over. Verse number 9. Here it is. Over. 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 Past the impossible. When you see what God can do firsthand. Then the question. The big question. Elijah to Elisha. Ask, ask what I shall do for you. Before I'm taken away. So what, what, is, what are you after, Elisha? Antioch North, what are you after? And Elisha said this, I beg you. I'm begging you for a double portion. I'm begging you that a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Now I've heard this preached by others and, the, and I've even heard them claim, and I've never done this myself, I just never bothered. But they claim that you can go through and count the miracles, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the miracles that Elijah did, Elisha did twice as many. Well, that's nice and warm and fuzzy. But let's keep it simple and biblical. What was the, who, who received double portions of anything? It was always the firstborn son. And he would receive a double portion so he could carry out the affairs of his father. So what do you want me to do now that you've, you've come through this river of impossible? You, you've passed, you went with me to the house of God. And you've been with me in the, in, in the place of victory. And now you've crossed this impossible river. Now, what do you want? I want a double portion of your spirit on me. Because I can see now. I can see what God wants me to become. And in order to be that kind of a father of God's household, I need the double portion. Now listen, listen to this. And Elijah says in verse 10, you've asked, a, you've asked a very hard thing. You've asked a hard thing. But nevertheless, here's the condition. This is, this is the condition. This is the condition as it was right then, but it was the condition all along. It was always this condition. If you see me, when I'm taken up, you'll have it. But he wouldn't, seen it. he wouldn't have seen it from Bethel. You can be in the house of God and miss it. He couldn't have seen it from Jericho. You can be in a place of victory and miss it. There's lots of happy churches around. There's plenty of happy congregations living in happy neighborhoods, driving happy cars with happy families and living the happy American life and actually prospering every year that goes by, getting happier and happier. And they'll never see the other side of the impossible. And they'll never be what God called them to be. Because you've got to be there and you've got to see me when I'm taken up. But if it's not so... It shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked. Here comes a chariot of fire. It parted them asunder. It divided the two. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he, then he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and he rent them in two pieces he picked up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and realized now more than ever before what it meant. 
And he went back and he stood by the bank of Jordan and he took the mantle of Elijah and he wrapped it up the same way that Elijah had. And he smote the waters just like Elijah had. And he says, where's the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had smitten the waters and cried that out, they parted just like they did for Elijah. And Elisha went over, and I watch this in 15, and the sons of the prophets, when they saw this, to, when they saw this, they said to him, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him, and they bowed themselves onto the ground before him. You want to be who God wants you to be? Then you got to get in the game. Or you can compromise. I'm not rebuking you. I'm not reproving you. All I'm doing is delivering the truth of the word of God. This is the way it works. You know something that bothers me, Brother Simpson? It bothers me. It bothers me. I'm old enough now to remember men, men's names, preachers' names, men that I've actually sat with, some of them I've eaten with. I've had a chance to talk with some of them, some of the finest Christian characters that you could ever come across. Men like, men like the old elder James Kilgore was the real deal. Real deal. He built a huge church in Houston. Huge, thriving, hot-bedded revival center. Some people would come into that building, I'm sure, and look at him and, and see, how, see how he lived and maybe the car that he drove, although I don't think it was too luxurious. And they would never have seen the years where he went with nothing. While his dad's preaching in Oklahoma and, and Louisiana and North Texas and, and, and they're sleeping in the back of a car. When they're, when they're being stoned while they're having tent revivals in church in, in towns that didn't want Pentecostals in their town. Stoned. Burning the tents. Cutting the ropes while they're trying to preach. He wasn't just born into some big building in Houston. Cleveland, Beckton, same thing. Sat, had dinner with C.M. Beckton one time in, at, at, at a pastor's place in Houston, Texas. And the guy was hosting Brother Becton's, uh, excuse me, another one of these guys named Pastor C.L. Dees' 80th birthday. And to surprise Brother Dees, the pastor had flown in Brother Becton because they were old pals from the gospel evangel evangelical pitch of the tent at the edge of town days. And they swapped stories while we sat at the table and ate. And I thought, dear God. I wish every young man could hear these stories because all they see now is the big churches. And then now, see, now we're in this place where the sons are taking over the churches. And they don't know what sacrifice is. It was handed to them lock, stock, and barrel. Here, son, take it over. And they already got the big building. They already got the money, the big payroll. They already, they've already got everything. They live first class and don't know what sacrifice is. And we wonder, and we wonder why some of these places have just plateaued and some of them have even started to go down. And we wonder why. It's because they don't know what the price of the promise means. You've got to go all the way through. You've got to have your own Jordan experience. You've got to have your own impossible experience. This isn't a cheap church. It's not a cheap church. And you're not a cheap congregation. And don't let anybody or anything or any spirit convince you that you're not a great church. And that you don't have a great calling. And that you don't have a promised destiny. <laughs> Praise God. Antioch, the apostolic church. Antioch, the apostolic church wasn't born on, some, on, on the top of a hill with a big white building. They went from pillar to post. I remember going to places on, for Sunday night service and there was a sign on the door of the rented building saying, sorry, we're not meeting here tonight. You got to go someplace else. 
Because we didn't know from one week to the other where we we're going to have to meet. We, we redid warehouses and painted this and painted that and changed this and changed that. And the Octi Apostolic Church wasn't born in luxury. It was born in prayer and born in sacrifice. People praying. People praying. People saying, Lord, I'll go anywhere. I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. Whatever your will is, Lord, let it be. But whatever it is, Lord, don't let me miss it. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to ask you. If you're in this thing the way God wants you in this thing, I want you to stand. And this is not a good time to sit. Praise God. Brother Simpson, will you do me a favor? Will you come and pray over this church? Would you pray over its destined promise? Because this is the real deal, people. This is the real deal. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we lose the purpose, the plan, and the will of God over this congregation, every family, every individual. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> The promises of God upon Antioch be upon this congregation right now in the name of Jesus. The deep things of God. Plant everything according to your will and uproot everything that is not like you, Lord, according to your purpose. And you're playing in the name of Jesus Christ. Ruta Baha Santa Baha. She on the Roto Robo Hobo Hosiah. Raise up men and women of God that will give themselves to you wholly, committed to your will and your purpose, willing to sacrifice all for you. Loose your strength, oh God. Loose your burden, Father. Ikarata Randa Lalalalabohosata Bahaya. Loose the miraculous. Loose the impossible. In the name of Jesus Christ. We release endurance. Rata Lalalalabohosata Bahaya. Give us ourselves to see in the name of Jesus Christ. Fortitude, oh God, to stand firm on the rock in the name of Jesus Christ. We lose faithfulness upon this people. Ratarebe Sioto, Ratiando Mosoto, no, Mando Rojo Sata Rabaha Sata Baha, Hiluruta Tabaha Sata Baha, Iki Yite Yando, Murushine Lalabo Jose, Ati, Ruta Baha Sandelebo Josiah. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, water every ground that's dry. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up, O oh Lord, in the midst of this congregation. In the name of Jesus Christ, we believe you for it. We trust you for it. In the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus, God, let the anointing in the ministry of sacrifice, the spirit of sacrifice come upon this people like never before, that they would give themselves, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name. Rate ye messi ando roto no 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 bohosaya. Rate la 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 bahaya. God, we come against selfish ambitions. 
in the name of Jesus Christ. Release the promises of God right now. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, pluck up, O oh Lord, everything that would hinder. Release us, O oh God, to your promises. Your purpose in Jesus' name. Mandoro talala atabahaya. Give us the grace, O oh Lord, to not look to the left or to the right, to pursue you wholeheartedly. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Haratalala as the mantle of Elijah parted the sea, the command, oh God, it's staying to be parted right now. I pray for this city in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. We claim Baltimore City and Baltimore County. Harford County. For the purpose of God. That the name of Jesus Christ would be glorified. That your power and your glory and your salvation would be loosed in the name of Jesus Christ. It's not for a name for our sake or that we would receive a name for ourselves. But the name of the Lord will be lifted on high. We lose your salvation, oh God. In the name of Jesus Christ. Your burden, oh Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. Your will, Father. And not ours. Your burden and not ours. Give us your passion. Your compassion, O oh Lord. Hiloruta Habahasaya. That we can see the men in the field as you see. In the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, pray, Lord, rain the former and the latter together. The outpouring of your spirit, O oh Lord. Spirit of the fifth God. In the name of Jesus. Pray for repentance, O oh God, that you would grant repentance upon hearts and lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray for transformation, the renewal of minds. In the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus' name, to what you saw, God, before the foundation of the earth. Mando Rosso Re Matana Mahasa Raki Koroshon Romo Tadala Bohose. In Jesus' name. I thank you for it, Jesus. Thank you for your calling. Thank you for it, Jesus. Thank you for it, Jesus. Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for choosing us. 
Jesus name keep us humble before you Lord Jesus name and Jesus name Let it fall on this congregation like never before. Jesus. Jesus. Let it fall on men and women alike, oh God. The young and the old. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. Amen. is bigger than an individual in the name of Jesus Christ bigger than an individual's ambition Jesus name lose your power your glory your anointing your vision your purpose Save to the uttermost, oh God. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. All over the house, when we just begin to give him thanks. Let's thank him with our lips. For everything he's doing, everything he purposes to do. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Believe you and trust you, Father. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Moko Hotat.